Hey, BizTalks family, it's Simon here from the marketing team with another quick Gravity how-to. And this one is all about account personalization. You may notice that when you sign into Gravity, your name is very formal with both your first and middle names being shown. This is because our system copies over the exact details from your ID document or passport during onboarding. But let's face it, not everyone likes to be called by their full name. That's why you can always change it in your profile settings if you prefer a shorter name or a nickname. You can also edit the names of the bank accounts that you connect to Gravity when making a deposit. Simply select Manage Bank Account on the menu and you can rename them to anything you want. That's it for now. Catch you soon. And I hope you enjoyed this episode of the BizTalks podcast. Three, two, one. And we are live. Hello and welcome everybody to another episode of the BitStots podcast. And we have a brother from over the ocean in the US. We have Edmund McCormack from Dechained. Edmund, brother, how are you? Welcome to the BitStots podcast. Good. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Firstly, how are things on, on that side of the pond? How's things over in the US? It's it's good, you know. We uh, we just came out of a, a three day weekend. Uh, couldn't imagine wanting to be anywhere else at five a.m. than joining you this morning. Um, <laughs> but no, it, it's been good. You know, we obviously in the in the crypto world uh, have been a little bit rocky as of late. Uh, but it's not any different than you know other places in the world. I think you guys have uh, the lovely Andrew Bailey from uh, Bank of England making some fun yeah. comments. <laughs> True that, true that. So let's jump straight into it then, crypto, right? Yeah. Uh, so tell me about D-Chain, your journey. When did you start it and why, really? Yeah, so in short, D-Chain, is, it's an education platform that I created about a year ago, really focused on helping people who want to get interested, who want to get involved in crypto, into it. It's really sort of that, that bridge between people who have been sitting on the sidelines but felt intimidated, felt like it was just too technical for them to ultimately get involved. And, you know, it, it's sort of been a, a road in, in progress to get to this point. Um, you know, I, I, I've been in tech for about 15 years, uh, working as far back as as MySpace, if people remember that on this podcast. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm yeah. pretty old. So, <laughs> so it was Tom from MySpace your friend? Tom was I, everyone's friend from MySpace. <laughs> Tom was actually a really good guy. Uh, there was actually two founders. There was uh, Tom and then there was this guy, Chris. Chris wound up, he was more of the business guy and wound up sort of making news later in the, his career. He was dating Perez Hilton regardless, but he was one of the uh, those people who felt like Facebook would never catch up. Facebook at the time was an EDU. You had to be in college. So sometimes we make well, that mistakes. That was a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> that, was a, that, that was a mistake. <laughs> so uh, yeah, no, so DJ, I mean, it, was I created it really because of sort of a perfect storm. So I was, I had just left Apple. So I joined Apple in 2010 uh, and had worked there until very early 2016. And coincidentally, I was on my honeymoon, I was in Thailand and all of a sudden my phone exploded. And I look at my, my phone, all these text messages, Apple was shutting down our division in favor of really trying to eliminate anything that could be seen as collecting consumer data. So they were really starting their privacy war then. And it sort of got wheels in my head turning, uh, saying, well, if they're doing this, then probably other tech companies are going to do this as well. And shortly thereafter, we had Cambridge Analytica, which I think was in Covington Corner. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, I think they had an office over there. Uh, and then all of a sudden, it really sunk in by saying, well, maybe this internet model that we have today really isn't probably going to work as we start to get advances in connectivity, in AI, as we start to do internet of things. And coincidentally, around that time, Bitcoin also started to, to start ripping. And this is sort of what hammered, what hit it home for me was, you know, I, I had been in crypto since 2011, in and out of the market, uh, starting really around, you know, the the Mt. Gox, Silk Road days and, and left for a little bit. Okay, so you was really early. Yeah, you was really early. Yeah, I had to, uh, in order to, to get involved in crypto in late 2011, I had to go to a, uh, a CVS, so uh, like a little corner store, use, a, use MoneyGram to send money off 
offshore to then fund my Mt. Gox account. So I'm not going to say any of the names because I don't know statute limitations. But uh, <laughs> I can say I can say it for you. I would know exactly what businesses you must have utilized. It was a very small world back then. Yeah, uh, but he 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 has done his time and he is out now. So and he's a New York guy. Oh, so yeah, I fully support yeah, there him. You go. <laughs> and props to you for knowing that. Um, so <laughs> yeah, so I I had a lot of friends that, and family who got involved in in Bitcoin and you know cryptocurrency in 2016, 2017. None of them knew what the hell they were doing from a, a financial standpoint, from a tech standpoint. And when the market started to turn, they were generally the last people to understand the signals that were happening. And, you know, they were left holding a bag uh, worth 80 percent less in a sort of yeah. scenario of why did that happen? How did it happen? And, and for them, I'm looking around saying they're still holding on to this, not knowing sort of which way this is going to go. Is it ever going to recover or are they just sort of you know, holding on hope? So, so how do you quantify that then? So yeah, there is two, there's a couple of different components to, I guess, your journey there. You've got the whole background of working in the tech industry in quite a big way, very meaningful companies. Um, do you code as well? Is that your background uh, or are you just working within tech? No, so I, I didn't code. So I was more on the uh, the business development side. Cool. So you're like me then. I'm, I've been in tech ages, but I don't freaking code. Yeah. Okay. But you also now you've set up an investment, ultimately consultancy uh, service and your speech patterns for very investment driven when you're speaking on crypto. Um, so what is the value proposition uh, that you see in the market and, and how do you discern and decipher your, your way through that? What is the crypto value proposition? Yeah, so the, the crypto value proposition, one is, you know, especially as of late, it's an alternative investment that people should be looking at as a potential means of generating a return in a market that is filled with uncertainties. Yeah. And I'll give you a good example here is, uh, you know, just speaking on US investors, you know, I often will do different you know private seminars private workshops for different investment groups and i usually will keep something in my back pocket and, and usually someone will come out and say well you know bitcoin is is like gambling you're going to a roulette table look everyone has their sort of their your opinions and we still have a, a stigma to get over you know because of course if you own bitcoin you just finance drugs and assassins <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I, I like to show them a chart and it's just a chart that shows these very dramatic peaks, drops, and then sort of this roller coaster. And I ask you, would you invest in this? And 10, 10 out of 10 times, people absolutely not. They think I'm talking about Bitcoin. And what I am, what I'm actually doing is I'm doing sort of a, a zoomed in snapshot of what gold was in the 70s. Mm. And I said, well, you think that this is the most safe investment of all time. Peter Peter Schiff is right now, his ears just perked up. Uh, you said gold, man. You said gold and Bitcoin. Schiff's like, what, what, what? <laughs> what? Like Dracula, he just sat up. <laughs> I hope he shows up at the Bitcoin conference. People boo him. But uh, so he, and people just all of a sudden realized, oh, wait a second. That was gold. That was gold in the 70s when, you know, the US left the, the gold standard and things got volatile. But Eventually, this became a stable asset and, and people started to look at it for stability. Same kind of scenario today. Actually, Citibank drew this exact parallel. I wish I thought of it. But instead of you know, the, the physical gold, they went to digital gold. And, and this is, you know, with our lives becoming more interconnected, with our lives becoming more digital, an industry that never changed, even as we started going online, which is the finance industry, all of a sudden has been forced to make some dramatic evolution. And if nothing happens of this bull run right now, I think we could take that away. What do you reckon has been the biggest fuel for this bull run? Um, so so what's, what's been a driver this time around? Yeah, I think institutional. And, and, and certainly, you know, I think a lot of people have talked about the impact of institutional investors, uh, but I think that the, more of them have come online and more of them have announced their intentions whether you're talking about, you know, the the PayPal's, the squares of the world, Morgan Stanley, Goldman, et cetera. But seeing, you know, the largest exchange, at least in the US, Coinbase, now on you know, the NASDAQ, Tesla getting behind it, uh, Starbucks, and then some of the biggest universities in the world also announcing, hey, we've been investing in Bitcoin for a while now too. So it's sort of a scenario where uh as 
people were looking around trying to understand what they would do with their finances with COVID. Scenario sort of like where there's a, a tsunami. You start to look at all, right, all of the animals are seeking a higher ground or seeking safety. I should probably follow them. And, and that's kind of the scenario where you're seeing retail investors who last bull run were leading it, starting to cautiously now follow behind. But up until this point, you see the emergence of grayscale, CME futures, you know, you, big banks are starting to put their money in and, and generate some excitement. So in terms of uh, de-chain, so just going a bit more into depth about what the model is. Uh, it doesn't sound too dissimilar to how, ironically, we started out. So we started out back in April 2014 as an educational house set up geared around private investors. And we actually done the wealth management aspect as well. So we manage their capital for them within Bitcoin mm -hmm. um, and we help educate and grow their portfolios. We actually shut down our advisory section to our desk uh, at the beginning of this year. Uh, mm -hmm. after a very long stint and we changed strategies quite drastically with it uh, a couple of years ago and start becoming quite focused refined and being more fundamentally driven um instead of chasing the sea of of coins uh, that were out there mm -hmm. how have you found i guess the the process of educating retail investors because that is challenging um, there's a lot of expectations of that. I know you're not managing funds, which probably makes it a lot easier. Um, but what, what's, what's, I guess, the most common questions and the most common things it is that you're, you're resolving for these people? Yeah. So, uh, and just let me unpack that for a second. So, in terms of you know a business model, I would say if you want to go into crypto and get rich, don't do education. Um, it's certainly challenging, <laughs> frustrating. Uh, all in one, you know, I started, when I started out, I, I figured, you know what, all the numbers, all the stats are saying, you know, go for millennials, go for that 34 and under. That just makes sense. Quickly realized that for us in the business model that we had created, which was, you know, we wanted to offer really low cost you know, courses and combine that with live access support. So not just myself, but people who, you know, do certain types of uh, services with and around crypto. So accountants, lawyers, founders, CEOs, et cetera. And quickly realized that you know, people want that, but they're not going to, they don't want to pay for it, which is okay. But then ultimately for me, this was the scenario that was the underlying problem, which was, you know, I, I come from the, the tech world, spent a lot of time in ad tech. I know how that, that content is being monetized. And oftentimes it's either through a sponsorship or there's sort of sponsored or personal sort of gains that someone that uh, content creator could be earning through promotion. And obviously won't go any deeper on that, but ultimately wanted people to realize, look, we want to be transparent in terms of how we you know, pay for these cameras and writers and, and produce things that are quality. Uh, and we're charging a nominal fee, which is about you know, $19 a month. I think at the time we're charging $15 a month just to get access to it. Uh, and we're not going to show you a certain coin and dump it. We're not going to you know, tell you that you need to buy this product because it's the best when it's not, but they're paying us. We're being very transparent in terms of how we monetize. And, and you could ultimately look at our content then as objective. We don't need to then take you know, money. Not that it's a bad thing. It just... Um, this was at a time when, you know, it was pretty evident that there were a lot of big name influencers who were starting to push products and then sell. I saw it on my side. Ultimately, though, it took a couple of months for them to start to call each other out, which has been entertaining. There's a very little reason to maintain strong integrity in this space. Um, and I feel like there's so much misinformation and misunderstanding what this technology truly is. And um, I want to unpack a little bit about my perspective, our perspective, um, yeah. the road that we've gone down in order to get our understanding of things. And ultimately, um, probably not hyper aligned. Well, in fact, I know I'm not hyper aligned with the traditional view of what cryptocurrencies are. Uh, in fact, even goes so far as to say that the term cryptocurrency 
is a very misleading one because Bitcoin was never introduced to the world as a cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. It was introduced to the world as a digital cash system and a public ledger, meaning there is no cryptography in Bitcoin. Public key, private key cryptography is a independent component that allows you to access the moving of coins. Bitcoin itself is not encrypted. So the beautiful invention that Bitcoin is, is it took the oldest thing we have, a piece of paper, digitized it and made it public. And that's the innovation. Now, when you take a piece of paper and you make it public, then you resolve something that is fundamental in contract law. Mm -hmm. You introduce the whole world to being a witness. And now we have a frictionless way of validating and allowing for commerce to happen without the requirement of being present and needing a witness or doing a docu very sign kind of scenario, right? So then the next thing is, okay, well, that's fucking awesome. Well, how do I write on this piece of paper? You need a pen as you always do. And in this case, there's only 21 million of these pens, but here's my issue. If those pens can only do three to four strikes on that piece of paper a second, then what that provides is a system that does 345 to 350,000 strikes on that piece of paper a day. Seven and a half billion people on the planet, right? We don't even all get a strike of the pen each. And then you look at the symptoms. We have fee markets booming wild, frantically out of control. And then I look at the influence that's come into crypto that's been the strongest advocate for what we coin and term as being a small block, right? So we've got this 10 minute same rate of time, 10 minute window of time. Um, but we are throttling the amount of interactions and density you can build within that 10 minute window of space. So it's always going to be a very Spartan, lonely place, a block in the Bitcoin blockchain. By Bitcoin, I'm talking about BTC uh, blockchain being one megabyte. But we then, on the other hand, and in my opinion, I think these are very uncorrelated and unfounded statements. We say that because there's this rarity around the fact that the world apparently is all going to be frantically running and looking for one of these diamond encrusted Cartier pens that right now are trading for 30, circa $37,000, $38,000, right? And when do we, or do you think we ever will get to a point where people are going to be sitting there with their shiny Cartier pen that we call a Bitcoin, right? And then eventually have an epiphany moment that, my God, this is a pen. Maybe I should use it as one. And then they try to use it and it cost them $100 to use the ink. And there's, and there's gray areas in how that's going to get taxed too. Yeah. So what... what where where is the is it is it utility important or or is it just hype? Yeah, so and I love that you you sort of break down the the process of you know proof of work. Uh, actually, even before Bitcoin, you know, you had Cambridge University uh, came out with a report. So proof of work existed before Bitcoin. It mm -hmm. was initially one of the first use cases was to address spam, and it wanted to ultimately force anyone who wanted to send spam to prove that there was uh, either effort being expended or there was some type of uh, you know, resource allocation being done. And ultimately, very quickly, you know, Cambridge came out and said, uh, well, this is effective. Inevitably, as computers, as processing power increases, it's going to be easier for you know, these spammers because they'll be able to game the system, but it's going to be harder for the average person to send an email and you can't charge because then it kills the email system. Yeah. So Bitcoin you know, with good intentions leveraged this, this system that, and again, who knows any of the, you know, the origins of who Satoshi is, uh, who they are, but it was, it was built on a, on a blockchain that I was, I'm hoping whoever created knew that we would have to get off very quickly. Why, why did we, why would we have to get off? I mean, from my interpretation of the white paper, um, it was never mentioned that we stay and stagnate at one megabyte blocks. In fact, it was something I've taken out of context due to the context at the time, which was uh, when you had something of zero monetary value, 
then, and you've got a bunch of nerds, probably the nerds are just going to try and break it and spam the network, sure. which is a very deflammatory word, spam, because yep. to say spam and associate that word with usage insinuates that that usage has no value. But then you're being a technocrat and dictating what a human being does deem to be valuable or not. And then that kind of cannibalizes the whole model of being a decentralized distributed system in the first place. But I digress. Well, when I get muffin top ads that I need to take weight loss pills, all true. I mean, I, great targeted media to me. Awesome. I would consider that spam. Or when there is, you know, uh, the, the old Nigerian prince email, things that are, that offer very little value or could be deceptive. Uh, that's what that's what I'm referring to. Obviously, teach their own. Yeah, no, 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 totally. I mean, but it's it's spam if we can't put a rate on it, right? So if as long as someone pays in order to get that slotted into the system, um, then you are aiding the proof of work mechanism in sense of that you're you're lubricating the miners, you're paying the miners more, right? And then a lot the miners have a, a right to either accept the zero fee transaction or not accept the zero fee. Uh, transaction. But I don't want to get too into like the technical stuff because you're not a coder, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm not a coder. And this isn't about uh, the hyper, super deep yeah. technical aspects. But I just want to understand from a more philosophical standpoint of value, um, why is is utility in Bitcoin specifically um, it's just so widely accepted as being stagnated at one megabyte, which limits utility? which I can't believe Elon Musk can't do basic mathematics. Um, seven and a half billion people, everyone come buy my cars, Tesla, <laughs> and I'm gonna let Bitcoin be a mechanism of payment because it's the future of payments. And didn't realize that he would only be able to sell 350,000 uh, cars a day if everyone paid yeah. on, on Bitcoin, which will be a great day for him. It'd be an amazing day for him, sure. right? But ultimately that's not gonna service the, the planet. How is someone like Elon making such a core fundamental mistake around uh, utility? Or am I making a huge mistake? Am I just seeing something that the whole rest of the space is is seeing that this is not a problem? I think, and, and I love that you, you bring this up. I think that this might be a conversation that happens next. Uh, I think right now we're, we're just sort of scratching the surface on environmental impact of producing this, this money. Uh, yeah, but for me, it's Again, the the understanding and and the um, the process of getting to this point of looking at cryptocurrency as a form of payment, as a store of value, we are just very much in the elementary stage of that. You had you know prominent figures in Japan, in England, even in the U.S. coming out over the last two weeks saying that this is highly dangerous. It's speculative, and and ultimately at the same time. You know, here in the U.S., we just we're going to print six trillion more dollars out. So I think the the idea of having something that is uh, is finite that can ultimately hold value through a limited supply that is where we are from an understanding economically. Um, I hope that we get to the point of saying, well, let's take a, a, another step deeper in terms of what's the real utility of this. But you know, we have so many more basic issues to address. Uh, like if I want to use Bitcoin to make any purchase, sounds great because it's easy now to use in my PayPal. But the fact is, is that I also have to be a part-time accountant now and keep track of all my strike prices and sell prices because the accounting, the tax implications on it is different than how the SEC in the US you know, dictates it as a commodity. So there's there's a lot of things I think we need to address before we get to the, the utility part. But I hope we get there. Mm. I mean, that's a very important point, um, definitely in terms of tax and actually integrating this into your real life um, and it making your life better, not more chaotic. Uh, it's definitely somewhere where we can innovate and just make the world a lot easier in that regard. Um, can't say I agree on the whole utility standpoint. Um, I I... I want to be very careful about how I go about saying this because the I've got no problem with the crypto space and the crypto investing space. I've done very well from uh, the crypto investing space. I definitely don't have a beef 
with crypto investing at all. Uh, but one thing I do definitely want to, to convey is that going back to something you said earlier about the whole casino mentality, uh, it is a casino. Uh, the whole crypto space is a casino. Um, 98% is a big freaking casino. And that's fine uh, as long as you are there and you've got the right risk tolerance to ride that wave. Um, and services out there that can make riding that wave easier, like what you're building and trying to do, uh, are mm -hmm. always going to have a very, very valuable space in this. And again, we done very well from having that model, right? So I get it and I have no judgment on it. And everyone needs to just keep on trying to make as much money as it is that they can um, to build their own sovereignty as quickly as they can. I don't think there's any market out there better than crypto that allows someone to go from zero to potentially hero uh, in, in, in such a quick time in a quick fashion. And I'm very, very pro individual sovereignty. My question to humanity and yourself is, once you've acquired riches, where do you build your wealth tree? Right? Where do you plant your wealth tree? Okay. And I'm going to give you the answer. You're going to think I'm talking shit. And I'm going to challenge every single one of you to go away and, and study and actually see if there's validity behind what I'm about to say. Okay. Now, the original Bitcoin as per the white paper was about creating a digital cash system. But even that was a very narrowed down possibility of truly what this technology is. At its core, great, because cash lubricates everything. True cash will lubricate everything. Energy is priced in, in time, right? And, and energy is, is what we're pricing with human production, labor, et cetera. And we have all of these different mechanisms of pricing energy on the planet. We have the US dollar, we have the GBP, we have the euro, all these different mechanisms, right? Mm -hmm. um, and what we do when we acquire wealth and we become successful, we want to exert the exact same amount of time, but we want to get an increase on our rate on time. So we might even move around the planet. I might go to Monaco, I might go to Dubai, I might go to the, uh, the British Virgin Isles, right? Because I, I, I want the better tax jurisdiction to get more uh, return on the same amount of time input. So when I see this white paper, nine pages, said digital cash system, I'm thinking this is probably going to be our best chance of creating the most harmonious representation of measuring human production on the planet, right? That's what decentralized and distribution is. That's what I love about Bitcoin. That's what I love about crypto. But here's my problem. What we have done in 12 years is that we have greatly confused the different frequencies of measuring time on the planet. We are worse than the banks. We are worse than the government when it comes to value creation. And it's a, that's, that's one thing. And it could just be all bandished into like excitement and this ex experimental phase, which is necessary. We are going through this experimental phase. We're now doing DeFi, we're doing all these different things and it's freaking great. It's necessary. However, if we go back to the true original spirit of what this is all meant to be, a very pro-humanitarian thing. We started this being very anti-bank, anti-establishment, but I think that's gone a little bit too far and it's really stepped into now anarchism, mm -hmm. right? We need to be functional. We need to exist within law and order. We need to change from within. And the very things that the crypto space puff their chest like King Kong and stand and scream and say that they're against, and I think most of this is, is ignorance. I don't think this is knowing. There's a few people who are doing it on knowing and they are the worst kind. We have been corrupted from the inside by the very banks and industries it is that we claim that we stand against. And this is where it's coming. It's coming through effectively MasterCard, dig Digital Currency Group, into Blockstream, into the developers camp, restrict the block sizes and you've killed the possibility that Bitcoin could be utilized for our political systems. You wouldn't have had the scenario that you had say last year with Trump and Biden, irrespective of what cap you sit on, you should have voting systems of integrity, right? We won't have Northern Rock scenarios in the UK or Lehman Brothers scenarios uh, in the US, right? You won't have Enron scenarios, Bernie Madoff uh, scenarios. You won't have arms dealings where you don't know 
who's really behind the arms deal. We have honesty. Humanity becomes honest because this ledger, this technology that now serves as humanity's mirror, essentially says we can see your polarity. Now, that system at the beginning was designed to handle as many transactions as you can put in a 10 minute window as possible. Mm -hmm. And that system is still alive today, Edmund, right? And it goes on today in the third fork of the Bitcoin blockchain, which is Bitcoin SV, right? I know how people feel about Bitcoin SV. I know how I feel about Bitcoin SV and the brand issues Bitcoin SV has and a terrible job of the branding uh, that Bitcoin SV uh, has been doing to some regards, but amazingly in other regards. It would be very unwise for anyone to overlook that the true project exists. It is protected by an excess of two and a half thousand patents by Enchain, which is obviously spearheaded by the individual that people uh, call fake Toshi, right? But the guy has two and a half thousand patents that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be ignored. Um, and we have companies such as mine who are very, say, agnostic when it comes to the respective camps. I don't care about Craig or say Vitalik, um, who's the best plumber, Mario or Luigi, mm -hmm. right? All I care about is, is what does humanity get? Are we going to get this promise that we actually have systems that implement honesty by the fact that they're there and they exist? Or are we still going to have a lot of wealth grabbing, riches grabbing, infighting, and this explosion of a billion different ways of measuring human productivity and time. Because I assure you, the big banks, governments, everyone it is that we claim that we stand against, want us to be exactly where we are today. Um, infighting, arguing, and having all of these different ways of reinventing the will without the legal and regulatory considerations. Because they will let a space grow to a couple trillion dollars and wipe you out with a legal and regulatory change. So you have to act within the confines of law. And again, this is exactly why we take the approach that we take. And um, I just don't buy the crypto bullshit anymore, to, to be honest, use it to make money. But when it comes to really understanding true intrinsic value and building wealth, um, I think a lot of people are gonna get burnt, Edmund. A lot of people are gonna get burnt. I, I could agree more with, with a lot of what you just said. Uh, first, I, I, I love that you look at yeah, the way that you look at, at how Bitcoin, how crypto sort of fits into the monetary system. And, and one of the things that I, I think a lot of people overlook is sort of the use of the word protocol. Uh, and certainly I'm not going to be the first to bring this up. But if you think about you know, the entire web and the Internet model, there are a number of different protocols that you know, were created to serve a number of different purposes. You have DNS for your, uh, your website URL, you had IP address, you had, you know, SMTP, which is your email, but there was never, there was never a mo money protocol, despite the fact that there really should have been. So uh, for me, when I read, you know, the, the white paper, it introduced the idea that this could fill that void, could, its potential. Uh, but ultimately, as you just alluded to, you know, there was a, a void that was created over the years and, and banks and, and regulators have stepped in and sort of added in their corruption. We, as, as a crypto industry, I mean, have sort of through infighting, through, you know, whether it's Hoskinson talking trash about Ethereum or it's, you know, all the maximalists out there claiming the other one is a fraud. Uh, it certainly doesn't do any good doesn't do any justice for you know the overall movement of crypto as a potential you know change agent uh especially in light of even regulated regulators today saying that what we have is highly speculative and you know doge and meme coins are certainly not helping our case <laughs> and also that it's you know it's it's not money so you know we have on one camp you know morgan stanley and goldman who are rolling out products for their customers and I think that that's a good thing. We need some type of regulation. Otherwise, we're looking at, you know, anarchy. Totally. And 
we need that in order to bring this this space into you know a, a, a place where it can ultimately fulfill its full potential with the masses. Otherwise, you know, we're going to have an instance where banks are going to shut off services where you can move money in and out of your uh, your actual exchange or wherever you're doing your trading. Uh, you're going to get limited in terms of you know policies, and you're seeing that right now in China where they're cracking down. So you, you do need some level of balance between you know government and the monetary systems because of the fact that a monetary system is sort of the fabric of our daily lives. Uh, and and I think anyone would be, be naive to think that you know major governments are just going to sit and you know on on the on the sidelines and allow this to happen as a passive participant. The government is uh they've got close eye on this and have had it for a long time. Like for instance, I've known any big banks, UBS Bank in the UK, their branch were set up before even I set up in 2014. And they were pretty advanced on, on and no one, UBS has, hasn't made any official big murmurs about having a crypto division. But I assure you, I know from firsthand that they've been geared for way over eight years. And the, the, the banks are very happy for us to be where we are uh, right now because they understand the game way better than anybody else could totally way better than anybody else. And also they understand law and their relationship with law. And if you tie this in with, I think this is gonna be the biggest revelation in crypto. And this is definitely people will think I'm, and maybe your audience might think I'm a bit nuts for saying this, but again, alert bells uh, to yep. to check if this, this checks out. So let me ask you a question. So everyone's like thinks code is law, keys are law own your private key, that's everything, right? If you and I are at a bar in New York, you leave your car key on the table and we leave the bar. Someone picks up your key, they go take your car for a joyride, right? Now, does that person own your car just because they've got your keys? Because you're reckless enough to leave it on the on the bar table. No, that, no that's be absurd, right? Because that's your possession because there's a registry. And what you do is, is you call the police and you prove to the police, look, this is my car. They'll check, they'll check the database and you say, go redeem my property, please. Right. And hopefully please catch up with the person. And then your, your keys are returned and you've got your possession. Now, my question is, it's not really a question, more of a statement for your audience or something to mm -hmm. ponder about. Um, what about if that's exactly how Bitcoin was designed to work? That keys are not law. And that if long, as long as you can tie your identity to a moment, so basically end an event, so a place in time, mm -hmm. let's say maybe you own some coins on Mt. Gox when Mt. Gox was stolen and you can prove that you owned X, Y, and Z. What about if that's all you need is proof that your identity owned property and then use the legal system to enforce your property rights and then have the legal system through a court order return your property back to you that the miners have to honor. What do you think that would do to the value of crypto if that turns out to be how it really all works? I think it's gonna undermine it. So you, know, you look at you know, countries around the world that have, you know, I wanna say, uh, Oppressive regimes, because that would be you know, judgmental. But uh, you know, there are many you talk places. About, you, talk, you talk about China. Well, and well, I'm talking <laughs> I, about. I, 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 say, I say it point blank: oppressive yeah, regimes. Yeah. So if you, if you don't want to own it, I'll own it. China. <laughs> or, or even you know, uh, places in the world where your you know title of your property is is loosely owned by you, where the governments come in often and, and take it from you. Uh, that often will then provide that power back to those governments, which to me, Bitcoin offered a solution to help address sort of the issues being plagued on society by those, by those government actors, the inflation, the corruption, all those things. You know, you give, and here's the sort of the, the sort of dual nature of this. You, you want to be able to have the freedom from those governments, but then at the same time, you also need some type of 
regulatory body, whether it's local or something acts like an Interpol, who can enforce. So good example is sort of is this. I often hear a lot of people talk about tokenization, specifically, you know, tokenization as it relates to real estate. Now, let's say, you know, I sell you a piece of property you know, through a smart contract, you buy it from me. And then all of a sudden, there's some type of real estate dispute. Who's going to come in and enforce that? Well, fact is, is that most courts of law don't see that as a legal contract today. And ultimately, it could be null and void, depending on you know, where you are in the world. Um, yeah. So not to, to digress from your, your question, but I think that, one, we need you know, new alternatives as it relates to you know, currency, as it relates to monetary systems. I think it justifies a new alternative to how we regulate globally, especially as we are more interconnected now than ever before. It's a very kumbaya statement, but we do need, I mean, we have, you know, IMF and regardless of what people think of IMF and you know, all those people who fly in on private jets to Davos and, and talk about climate change, um, you know, we do have these, we have these bodies, but the fact is, is that we're sort of, we have a system that also is talking on both sides of the mouth. Jamie Dimon from you know, Chase is talking trash about Bitcoin for years. He's always, he's always done that. He's always done that, even for his, even for his Barclay days. Yeah, so. and then also cre- filing hundreds of patents and building and buying his own blockchain. So, I, I, I mean, here's the thing is, and this may or may not make you know, good sort of radio for the podcast, but I agree with almost everything you're saying here, which is, you know, we have a financial system that is sort of sitting on the sidelines. On one hand, we have banks who are saying, you know, this is, you know, the future of money. But then we also have other banks, uh, HSBC, saying, well, it funds terrorism. Funds terrorism. Well, actually, the number one currency for terrorism is US dollar. And one of the best banks, if I'm going to launder money, is HSBC. So absolutely. They over customize their windows for you. Just yeah, so exactly. You fit in your, it's just so you can fit in your briefcase. Yeah. But that's great, to be honest, that they're looking in the technology, but ultimately they will never apply this technology the way that say we are applying this technology. So we are going to be the world's first verifiably solvent, transparent financial organization uh, soon to, or in the future to be bank um, because we're willing to back what we say and allow the world to look up our skirt ultimately and actually see our reserve ratio if we're solvent. Um, and to what degree is what we're putting the final touches uh, on, just how much level of detail we want to show for the multiple different levels, et cetera. And it's possible, it's always been possible. It's just no one's been incentivized enough to do it, to offer users an experience that is no different to a traditional bank, but the differences are you can verify that this bank actually has what they claim that they have for you. Mm -hmm. That's a very core fundamental use case for a technology, a blockchain technology that that every man on the street could understand immediately. Mm -hmm. No more Lehman Brothers, no more Northern Rock, at least not with your money, right? Because you would know. And I don't see banks wanting to implement that as a tech anytime soon but they will start having a problem once smaller players implement those types uh, of, of solutions uh, and start bringing people in because that's the way that I see slowly but surely the change happening from within. And I think the way that the whole crypto space has conducted themselves and the realization they're all gonna get was shown last year in America, I believe it was Portland, right? So Portland, your summer of love mm-hmm. last year, right? Uh, oh. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Chaz, right? To me, I was sitting back in the UK, looking in, I'm like, this is crypto. What's going on in Portland right now is a symbol for where we're going with crypto. Anti-bank, anti-government, hate law, hate order. Let's do it all ourselves. And when you get the opportunity to play uh, without the interference of law, order, and structure, you might not have the outcome it is that you want to have. 
you might actually create an environment that's actually far worse um, and invites all the worst things it is that you could possibly imagine. And I feel like we've got a lot of that flavor. So I think we deserve the bloody nose and bad reputation um, that we have, but also uh, I just want to say, I'm glad that there is people out there who are trying to provide uh, education. And I hope that education is, is geared around people understanding the true importance of the core of this technology, that it will be one of the most revealing, important, transformative societal differences that this planet needs because fundamentally it's just a piece of freaking paper that allows the whole world to read on it. And also the pen allows the whole world to write on it. And from that, we become more accountable to one another. And that's what we need to, to, to really embrace and, and keep a hold on, uh, brother. So any last words from you? Uh, Edwin, before we round things up? No, I, and, and well said, you know, I, I agree. You know, I, we saw it, you know, with dot-com bubble, a lot of the crap, a lot of the the hype, the buzz, the vaporware that was out there. And I guess it was vaporware before it was even called vaporware. <laughs> they went to the wayside, but ultimately what sort of, what continues on is the innovation, is the technology. Uh, I think we see that. I think, you know, we have an exciting horizon on it you know, sort of ahead of us as it relates to, mm. as I said before, you know, AI and with 5G starting to take bigger hold in the world, you'll see, you know, internet of things starting to, you know, rear its head and then we become more connected. But the totally. fact is, is that, you know, for me, you know, the, the currency is the, the way that I think people can associate and then sort of bring something that's abstract to become a little bit more tangible. Um, I, I'm excited sort of at the possibilities that this now offers companies that wouldn't be able to capital raise to start you know, getting involved. It lowers the barriers for new technology, new incumbents, challenges sort of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an old tech, ad tech guy, so it challenges sort of the Facebook and Google. So anytime that happens, I'm all for it. So, uh, but look, I, I'm, I'm so excited about sort of the, the foundation that you guys laid, it allowed me and, and sort of D-Chain to, to come into this space and sort of follow the path that you guys trailblaze as it relates to education. So uh, you know, first and foremost, wanted to say thank you. No, I appreciate you, brother. I appreciate you coming on. Um, one last question I have for you before you run away. In fact, two questions. Um, first is, are you now going to go and look at BSV uh, a little bit more differently? Uh, in fact, what is your opinion on BSV? What, what's your opinion on BSV? Pre and post this conversation, what's, what's your opinion on BSV? I mean, it's 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 true. It's the true Bitcoin vision and Satoshi vision, for for lack of better words. Um, you know, I think it holds the the core value that sort of the, the underlying goal of of you know what we're all here for. Um, you know, sort of intact, and it sort of you see a bit of a bastardization of that as the years have gone by, you know, you see, totally. you know, and I love Vitalik. I don't know him personally, but it doesn't matter what I say. He's a billionaire. So who cares what I say? But, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, in the process of building Ethereum, the world computer, we built a fiefdom and we built a you know, walled garden. You know, we commercialization creeps in and we sort of are left with something that doesn't even resemble what it was initially set out to build. Um, so I, I'm really, my, my POV, my perspective on, you know, BSV has, has not changed, you know, before this, because I think that they hold on to something that to me wasn't broken. And it was, it was sort of the, the untainted, uh, uncorrupted. And I, I, I'm, I mean, I've been a big fan of it for a while, you know, but the fact is, is that yeah, you know, it's, it's, I think a select few of us. Yeah. I mean, it is a select few of us and it takes, uh, someone with good discernment to really go through that. And it's baptism out there. Um, and everyone's, everyone's got the torch to flame you when you, when you tout the words, uh, BSV, but for me, it just shows a great degree of maturity that ev that's for someone to look into a project and keep their opinions out the way, even Vitalik's very heavy weighted opinion on all things Craig and, and BSV. And this is why I don't like genuinely, 
Vitalik is Luigi, Craig mm -hmm. is Mario. They're still plumbers, right? And that's what they are, they're plumbers. And just like any good plumber, I wanted to come into my house, install my system and never fucking phone him again, <laughs> right? And, 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 and that's how it should be. And we should be out there building houses, right? Um, and that's the stage that I'm really excited that I think we're entering now. I think NFTs are a huge component uh, of the world out there looking for houses. Um, just unfortunate that 99% of those houses have the wrong plumbing. So a couple of months in, you take a shit and your house stinks of shit because you can't flush. Um, you're left with an iPhone that's just bedazzled <laughs> and you're like, what the hell just happened here? This was beautiful and I bought it. Yeah, <laughs> literally, I get it. Literally. Uh, but brother, tell, tell the audience, where is the best place to find you? How did they yeah. get in contact with you? Um, yeah, that stuff. Yeah, so you know, our, our site is dchained, D-C-H-A-I-N-E-D.com, but we're hosting live webinars to introduce. We're really geared for you know two groups of people, people who are new to crypto and want to get involved and need handholding, need someone you know on the other side to walk them through it. Uh, and then people who are looking to just try to expand outside of you know, the Binance, the Coinbase of the world and start to learn other areas of the crypto space. Uh, we certainly don't endorse any one particular coin, any one platform. We want to help bridge that gap. So if you're interested, check out it's earningwithbitcoin.com. Uh, simple and easy, earningwithbitcoin.com. So I'd love to see any of your listeners. When's your next webinar? Tonight. Uh, well, it's, it's a little late for you guys. Uh, it's 7 p.m. Eastern, but I do it every two weeks. Okay, I was gonna say I'll come check it out. Okay, maybe not this one, but I'll check out the next one. Yeah. Um, Edmund, it's been an absolute pleasure, brother. Thank you so much for coming on the BitStocks podcast. Wish you nothing but success oh. and continued success uh, with your business and also with being a, a father to two beautiful young ones. Uh, so love it by love and light to you and your family. And uh, yeah, long may your journey continue and uh, long may the yeah. embrace of SV uh, yes. continue as well, brother. Thank you for having <laughs> me on. This is an absolute pleasure pleasure to mine. All the best. Take care. See you. That's it, everyone. End to another episode of BitStock Podcast. And as always, in traditional fashion, please like, comment, subscribe if you really enjoyed the podcast. And until the next time, peace, love, and light. All the best. Hello, beautiful people. Hope you really enjoyed that conversation I just had with Edmund. And considering the subject matters that we spoke on, I think the best body of content to follow on from here would be the BitStock site series where we touch on some political affairs and some monetary ones too. Until the next time, peace, love, and light. All the best.